Howdy y'all. Today we're going to be talking to Mr. John Evans of Air Guys. He's a certified industrial hygienist out of New York. We're going to be talking about COVID, the EPA, dwell time, and business pivots during a pandemic. But first, today's episode is brought to you by the professional Xactimate writers over at Claims Delegates. If you like fast, accurate Xactimate estimates to your inbox, check us out at claimsdelegates.com. Boom. All right, all right, all right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Andy McCabe. This is The Claim Clinic, and I am your claim doctor. But I have the mold doctor and the COVID doctor in the house right here in front of me, Mr. John Evans. How you doing, man? I'm doing well, and uh, thank you for uh, having me on. It's uh, always good to hear what you have to say as it relates to what's going on in our world and how things are changing. Well, today I don't have much to say. That's why you're here. Uh, John Evans uh, runs a company called Air Guys. You can see it in his background right here. Uh, but for all of you listening on the, uh, uh, sorry, on the podcast, sorry, I've had way too much coffee today in my COVID bunker here in Bend, Oregon. So he's uh, in New Jersey. Yeah, is that right? I'm in New York, uh, New about 50 York. miles north of Manhattan. To, to acclimate your listeners and viewers, 50 miles north of Manhattan is a little bit north of West Point, the United States Military Academy. Perfect. We are uh, just west of the Hudson River. Our biggest city, if you want to call it that, is the city of Newburgh. And mm. that is sort of the, the metroplex that we're in. We are an industrial hygiene firm that services uh, contractors, insurance agents, restoration professionals throughout the tri-state area, which is New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and a little tiny sliver of uh, eastern Pennsylvania on that I-84 corridor. And we've been helping people sort of understand and analyze the situations that they're dealing with for uh, many years. As air guys, we're in our second full year of operation, uh, but I've been involved in the restoration space since 2009. Nice. I love it. I love it. Ordinarily, right, you're doing a lot of mold. You're doing a lot of maybe some, some what's that radiation people have in their basements? Uh, uh, a little bit of radon. Radon. A little bit of radon. Okay. Uh, Lead and asbestos. Building syndrome, asbestos, yeah. all that good stuff. But now, COVID. The world right. has changed. The world has blown up especially in your neck of the woods. So let's start with that. We had some notes. Uh, so I'll, you know, we actually took notes and I have some, I have an outline here, but I want to start at the end of the outline. Run us through. Let's start in January to now. What did we know then? What did we do then? And what do we know now? And what are we doing now that's different? Once you uh, set the stage for us. I think around New Year's, uh, people were starting to see on the national news and on Twitter and their online news sources that hey, there's something a little funky going on over there in China. And yeah. wow, they're really taking draconian measures. They're, they're shutting down a city of 11 million people. Can you believe Commies. That? Commies. Exactly. And we're seeing images of people, you know, kicking and stream, screaming. Uh, being drugged down about. the street by the right. police. Yes. That'll never happen here, we thought to ourselves. And guess what? We, <laughs> we, uh, we just saw we that yesterday of, on the news. I know. And, and so I think that our world literally has changed since my line in the sand for this world changing was around the Super Bowl. Okay. The Super, the Super Bowl ended and our world was still sort of okay and we were hearing in the background about hey this coronavirus thing oh there's a case on a cruise ship or you know there's a case at a, a retirement home uh, out west somewhere um mm -hmm. but it's not gonna it's not gonna come here they got it licked everything's gonna be fine and unfortunately uh whether being provably untruthful or just ignorant. Some of the politicians that were out there talking about this were saying, this is nothing to worry about. We got it licked. Before we know it, the cases are going to be down to zero. You fast forward to sort of the end of February, and uh, some municipalities are starting to take serious measures, especially out west in, uh, uh, in Oregon and Washington. Um, yeah, we started early. Uh, Washington yeah. was, was the catalyst for sure. We mm -hmm. had 17 people die right away. Uh, right, And that's when I think that it, three or four days after that, I was uh, reprimanded for going to the grocery store. So uh, we, we moved inside in a hurry. Now, what does it look like now for you guys out West? 
we're still pretty much highly encouraged to stay indoors, uh, but you wouldn't know that by going to Costco. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, there's some people that are taking this seriously and they're wearing their masks and they're and they're limiting their stuff. But there's also, you know, my wife went to Costco yesterday with her mask on and everything. But she said uh, while she was there, there were people no masks uh, walking mm -hmm. through, reaching over other people in the aisles to get stuff and and going to Costco to buy plants. So um, right. it's 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 all over the map. It's frustrating, it's frustrating. So the, the, then we had substantial changes on March 11th. And, I, and I'll tell you, at the end of February, still here on the East Coast, oh, whatever's going on out West, it's not gonna happen mm. to us. Now, there's an ocean se se separating them from China, and, but we're way over here, we're safe. And we got and the Rocky Mountains, so that's exactly. a filter. What happens March 11th? March 11th, people are starting to, you know, get ready for basketball, and it's going to be the March Madness. Oh, and, the dance. I miss the dance. Uh -huh. And literally, uh, the sports people are talking about it online. There's no way they're going to cancel the tournament. I mean, this is not a thing. The people it's America. The, yeah, the people are saying, oh, it's just, it's the flu plus plus. It's not really a thing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were wrong. Leaders of our country did the right thing, whether uh, in private entities, giant entities like the NBA and the NCAA, they did the right thing. And I think like for me personally, when the basketball tournament gets canceled, that's when you know there's going to be a change. Yes. That's, Alarm it, bells going off. Yeah. That, so that was March 11th, a month ago, almost today. The world changed. And then after that, what happened? Then, oh, social distancing. Maybe get yourself some masks. Maybe have some people stay home and work remotely. Maybe stagger some shifts. So literally from the Super Bowl, very beginning of February, in a period of five weeks until March 11th, the world, the world flipped upside down. Things that we saw on TV in December and January that we thought would never happen here, they are here. Just, you know, people aren't kicking and screaming in foreign tongues. They're being, mm. you know, ushered to where they need to go in a more um, reserved manner, I would say. Right. Well, I think someone would argue that the Kansas City Chiefs actually winning was the, the catalyst. That That's what caused the world to flip, and, and that's part of the problem. Right. I think it's possible. I think it's possible. <laughs> oh, so you are active actively helping contractors, helping property owners deal with this. What are you doing? What types of things are you doing now in, in the trenches, as it were, with this COVID-related stuff? So, and should I we mean, call it COVID? Should we call it, what should we call it? COVID-19 is the illness that you get as a result of uh, exposure to the 2019 novel coronavirus. Okay. So the virus itself is the 2019 novel coronavirus. COVID-19 is the, the illness. It is the, the viewable and feelable result of being infected with this unusual virus. Okay, so but what are you doing? My world pivoted quickly. Sure. Um, I was getting 80% of my calls prior to the world switching on March 11th. We're still, can you come test this for asbestos? I have mold in my house. Can you go crawl up in my attic? Can you do an assessment? Can you do testing? Contractors would call, hey, we're still working. We have projects going on. Can you go do a clearance? Can you do inspection and sampling, et cetera, et cetera? And then first week of March, the phone just stopped ringing. Mm -hmm. And I'm a member of the AIHA, which is the American Industrial Hygiene Association. And they're a great trade group that sort of has a finger on the pulse of what's going on with building science and building inspection and analysis as it relates to environmental hazards. And they send out emails every day. And you were starting to see a switch in early March. Mm. This coronavirus is a real thing and it is coming and you got to get ready for it. So a lot of it was on the fly education. And, you know, the education for us as hygienists changed almost weekly. Mm. What were we hearing at first? At first we're hearing, oh, the, um, uh, the coronavirus, couple hours on a surface, you know, get yourself some Lysol, no need to wear a mask. Continue going to the movies and the theaters and the drugstore and the grocery store and your kids' ball practice and all that. And that was, that was the beginning of March. Second week of March here in New York City, the New York City Health Commissioner was still telling people, you know, to go out and celebrate Chinese New Year and mm. to go to the shows and support Broadway. And, you know, th these people work so hard, they don't need to be laid off. And like we discussed, when was, when was Mardi Gras? I'm going to look that up while you're talking. Mardi Gras, the, uh, it's the second week in 
February. My recollection is it's like a week long. Okay. It start, it's like right before, uh, right before Valentine's Day. Yeah. So that was – they went ahead with Mardi Gras. They did. And now New Orleans is, is paying the price, as it were. Yeah. But I, don't, I don't think as a nation we were as aware of the dangers, of the risk. Uh, at that but time. Well, unless you live in Louisiana, your worldview generally doesn't include what's going on in New Orleans. True. When do we when do we hear about New Orleans? Super Bowl, Mardi Gras. <laughs> you know. Period. Exactly. Or, or that hurricane that happened, but you know, it's right. been a while. But yeah, and, and they've mostly recovered. Um, but what I'm doing at this point is I had to pivot my business as a hygienist and, you know, get the word out to all of my contractor partners. Okay, guys, th- this is coming. And you're either going to be ready to act or mm. you're going to be sending people home. Thankfully, some of the major ones here in New York shared my view and prepared themselves. Purchased new equipment that they didn't have before in large numbers. What uh, is that equipment? The, what is that? What what are they cold, using they now that they weren't? A large amount. I mean, a, a small to moderate sized restoration company might have one or two cold foggers. They might have an electrostatic sprayer. They might have way more air scrubbing equipment than they would have uh, prior to this. Mm-hmm. And getting that from their big suppliers, John Don, Aramsco, Interlink, the big boys. And when, when that stuff sort of dried up in the first week of March, okay, mm-hmm. guys, let's pivot. Let's find non-traditional sources. They're going to places like Tractor Supply. They're going to um, places like Acme Tools online that has a big presence in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And finding gear at these non-traditional regional places that you never would have thought of before. They also sort of loaded up on a lot of the chemicals that they felt were going to be included or added to this list that the EPA has of endless chemicals. So we had, we had contractors betting, gambling on, uh, well, we can't get this chemical that we know is listed. We bet the MP, uh, EPA is going to add this other chemical. So they just went ahead and bought it. Yes. This, and this happened. I know I could, uh, I could tell you 10 that I know of that were like, we're going to get this stuff. We feel very strongly. And unfortunately, some of them got sold snake oil. Mm. You know, the, the salesman said, oh, well, this formulation is definitely going to be added to the list. And now they're sitting on a, a stockpile of a very fragrant chemical that doesn't really do anything. <laughs> you know. So, so what is what does work? What what it does work? What should work? Uh, and what doesn't work? Let's let's go with uh, what does. Let's let's go with what doesn't work. Let's let's so, do that in reverse. Okay, I, I won't say what doesn't work because nobody knows. Okay, what doesn't so work. so explain this that. Why thing. why is that? There's a list uh, that's put out by the EPA. It is updated twice daily of chemicals that are authorized for the use to uh, handle emerging pathogens. As of this morning, it was 32 pages long, it, and it includes all the big boys that we know of. You know, it's your Benefect, it's your Benefect Decon 30, it's your Bioesque, it's your Concrobium, it's your Sporocidin, a whole list of Clorox chemicals, many of which are available in a household formulation, and then a bunch where you can get them in 55-gallon drums. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to one of the rebels who is a, a saleswoman for one of the big supply houses, uh, first week of March. Hey, I need some Benefect. And what does she tell me? Oh, just had a tractor trailer come in. Somebody bought the entire tractor trailer without even seeing it. And it's don't driven it. Now. Just ship yep. it to me. Just wow. ship it, you know, about, about $300,000 worth because, the, you know, they were, uh, uh, they were expecting that this was going to come and they're a large metro area and not here in the Northeast. Anything that's on that list, the EPA is taking the position we believe that the formulation of this particular chemical is going to kill or render inactive this 2019 novel coronavirus because it was effective against SARS in Mm. 2013 and then MERS as well, the uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Mm -hmm. virus. So anytime that your contractors are using chemicals that are on that list that are not expired, I've run into that a couple times. Oh, I got a really good deal on this bio-esque. And then it's you only and you look, six years old. <laughs> you look at the bottom of it and it says 2017, you know. Yeah, chemicals then, do then, go bad. 
You, yes, they do. You're in compliance. Okay, so it's yeah. one thing. It's one thing to have the chemical. It's right. the other thing. The application of that chemical is key to its effectiveness. Don't be Rufus's restoration. Go in there with your uh, pesticide sprayer. Pour two gallons of the Benefect inside. Pump it up. Uh, wrap a T-shirt around your face and go spraying the walls and say, "Yep, you're all virused out, sir. That's going to be 5,800." That would that would not be the right way to do it. Okay. No. And Note I've to seen, self. <laughs> but I've seen it <laughs> because I get the call after Rufus has left and submitted his exorbitant bill, and then a real company comes in and is like, "Well, no, what what you're describing doesn't really sound like it's correct." What is correct? Correct is knowing your dwell time. Dwell time is the action word that we're uh, hearing a lot of as we're handling this. Every single one of the chemicals on the end list has an EPA registration number that is on the label. You can cross-reference that EPA registration number with the one that's on the EPA website because as most of you are aware, there are a variety of different formulations. Some of the big companies might have their own that has the same EPA labeling as one that we buy at a Ramsco or Interlake. Okay. Um, the other thing is you're able to see from the EPA registration, you can type in that number. It's usually about seven to 10 digits long, and there will be about six to 10 pages on the EPA website in PDF talking about dwell time. Mm -hmm. How long must the chemical be physically present on the surface or item before the kill claim can be um, substantiated. efficiently sure. substantiated. Right. So here's what you got to do. Not only are you doing the disinfectant application, but either someone on your staff or more properly, a third party um, hygienic inspector, whether it's an IEP, an IH like myself, should be coming out and verifying that you're doing what you said you did especially if you're in a large commercial structure, a municipal building, that sort of thing, because this is a time that none of us have ever experienced before. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that I can think of in my lifetime is like 9-11, where the world literally changed overnight for everybody. Yep. And so when you're up late at night watching TV, when you can't sleep, when you're thinking about what you're going to record on your next podcast, who do we see on TV? It's the lawyers talking about 9-11 from 19 years ago and how you can get your money. I am very confident that 19 years from now, the same lawyer is going to be on TV telling you that Andy didn't have his dwell time on long enough or there wasn't an, an SDS sheet disclosure. And, oh, did you get sick as a result of exposure to chemical X? You know, call right. us today. You know? Right. Yeah, so, so not only do you have the exposure to the virus – or whatever mm -hmm. else is in the air, you have the exposure to the chemical that you're introducing to the environment. And that's why the PPE, which is the second most important thing on that EPA registration uh, information available on uh, epa.gov is crucial because it tells you specifically the PPE that is required and the application methods that are approved. Some of the chemicals on there are only supposed to be applied by hand or at the end of a, an applicator. Some of them can be put in an electrostatic fogger. Some of them can be cold fog, but not all of them. So you really need to know what you're pouring out of that, you know, $50 a gallon of white bottle into your bucket before you actually start doing the work. Wow. Anybody can go and buy this stuff. Sure. Andy, you, you could go tomorrow uh, and pay way too much and buy all the gear you need to be, you know, Andy's Acme Janitorial Service. Great name. But I'm writing it down. You know, but don't do it. <laughs> you got to know what you're doing, you know, got to know what you're doing. Okay. So how do you know, and, and this is your, this is right in your, your, uh, your wheelhouse. How do you document and test that, uh, the claims that these contractors are making, uh, they're actually performing that they're, they're providing that outcome. How do you test for that? So the three major laboratories that are offering services like this are LA Testing, EMSL Analytical, and MLab P&K, okay? And all three of those vendors have been emailing me uh, at nauseum, informing me that they have surface cleaning efficacy testing analysis. What does that mean? Wow. What yes. does that mean? Please interpret. 
no lab, no commercial laboratory uh, is going to allow any, anyone, whether it's one of your uh, workers or clients, to take a swab of something, send it to the lab, and try and grow coronavirus. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, well, you and, don't grow coronavirus. It, it yeah, doesn't grow it, and, and, and outside of the body. Yes, pe people don't understand that. They think it's the same as you know mushrooms or fungi or bacteria, and it's just not. It's just not. But what are they asking um, in many cases? Uh, we had a county bid yesterday that I'm helping a contractor with, and they wanted uh, pre and post biomass analysis. And this is one of those things where there are a lot of IHs that are, work for the county or a manufacturer or a big company that have never done what we do in the field, which is go out, third party assessment, sampling, analysis, and applying science and rules to the facts that have been presented. Right? Because what of what you told me last week, less than 10% of certified IHs, CIHs, or, or whatever they are, I'm sorry, that was not meant disrespectfully. Less than 10% of these licensed folks or members of the IA, uh, AIHA actually specialize in the air, indoor air environment. Correct? It, it, is, it is definitely less than 25%. I'm sure that they're going to do a survey because when these type of environmental events happen, uh, those that were not active or recently retired, yeah, what's the old line? As soon as I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen because yep. there's going to be a new normal with with building analysis Absolutely. and you know hygienic standards that you have to follow. And I'll just give you an example. Back in January, if you wanted to go to Vegas and get yourself a nice room, you go to the Bellagio or the Wynn or you know the M if you want to stay off the strip a little bit. You pay a couple bucks, they give you a nice room, big fancy room, take the pictures, put them on Instagram and Facebook. Did you ever consider, like, there was a dude that i never seen before sleeping in that bed five hours ago, okay? <laughs> you know, the or, standard of, or whatever he was doing in that bed, or whatever maybe he was not doing sleeping. Exactly, right. The standard back then that you expect when you go into a hotel room is the surfaces have been wiped off and clean, the phone has been wiped down. Fresh sheets, fresh towels, they've run the vacuum, they've put the shades just so, and they've, you know, moved the stuff on the desk around. And it's a and fresh can... mint instead of the one that was left. The, a new mint yes. is on the pillow. Yes. Uh -huh. Here's the thing. That can't be your expectation anymore because of this new world that we live in, you know? Your expectation going forward is going to have to be, well, I, can't, I don't want them just running some pledge over the countertop. I want the room, you know, disinfectant applied. And I want to know Absolutely. what they're using, you know. What if it's not a hotel? What if it's a rental car? Someone just turned in that Ford Taurus, and what they do? They ran the vacuum and put a dirty Windex rag over the steering wheel and said, nope, doesn't smell like smoke in here. Put it back on the lot. That's not going to be the standard anymore. It's just not going to be, in, in my opinion. So what so we're being asked to do is – Go in and do pre and post with these uh, special swabs that come from the laboratory. Um, they are in a lot different of a broth. So if you see your hygienist sort of unscrewing a little cap and it's like, oh, that looks like a urine sample. Not a urine sample. It, it is a broth so that we can actually figure out what's going on on the end of the swab in the lab environment. What they are asking for is the following. And this is for a large municipal contract, the municipalities here in New York has about 75 buildings. They want a hygienist to go in and pick, without telling the contractor, five surfaces prior to the cleaning to go and swab. So I dress up in the Total Recall space suit with my PAPR, the bigger <laughs> fella. I like the, the cold air blowing onto my face yes. instead of sweating inside of my full face respirator. I go in, I, I pick five random areas. I mark them, I photograph them, I take a swab. It goes to the lab. What happens at the lab? They unscrew this swab. They put it on a Petri dish. They rub it across the Petri dish, sort of like a strep throat culture that you'd have done for your kids. And they put it in the incubator for 48 hours. This is the pre. They wait two days. Then they take it out of the incubator. They look at it. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever number of colonies. Okay? 
At the end, once your uh, rebel force is done with their disinfectant application and cleaning in full PPE, I go to the same five areas and do a post. We're not testing for coronavirus. They just want third-party laboratory analysis that the surface is cleaner than it was when you started the job. Cleaner. And cleaner. cleaner. They're not asking for zeros. They want the number at the end to be lower than the, than the number at the beginning. But, you know, you have to wait two days for that. And if this is a five or six figure building that you're doing cleaning on, do you want to have to wait two days before you find out from the hygienist? Oh, crap, guys. Sorry to tell you, it failed. Time to re-respond and get your labor force back up and re-gown and put your masks back on and go in and clean these areas. So that's why, in addition to doing the pre and post in a uh, municipal situation, we're doing the ultra snap ATP. There's a box that you've probably seen your hygienist use before called a luminometer. Uh, the machine is made by Hygiena and a variety of other um, less well-known brands. And these are single use swabs that you as a contractor are probably well within your right to uh, buy your own machine and do your own testing before you have the third party guy come in because you know what it costs to have a hygienist go out to the job. Wouldn't you rather- You guys are too expensive. Your own knowledge, like, okay, the guys say they're done. I tested some areas that I think that the hygienist is probably gonna look at. The numbers are all good. Let's call our IH and have them come out. And I'm seeing that happen more and more, um, especially with uh, some of the mid majors, the, you know, the, the 10 truck plus operations that are not franchised. They want to make sure before they have a firm like mine come out to do an inspection that they feel good about it. And so that's what we're doing as well. The ATP is great. It gives us an on-site determination and there's a written standard from the manufacturer that basically says, hey, if this swab has a result of greater than 15 RLU, uh, relative light units, uh, for those keeping score at home, um, then you are fine. You have to be below that number. If you're above that number, it's unsatisfactory. It needs to be recleaned. All right. Uh, John, I'm going to have to apologize to you. For everyone watching on Facebook, uh, I've got to go deal with something in the other room. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but I can definitely hear it. Uh, we will edit this out of the podcast, but give me one minute. All right? Go do what and- you need to do, and I'll sing for a little bit. Okay. Well, here we go, America. It's just yours truly, John Evans, here from the... Uh, the bunkered confines of my house here in beautiful Cornwall, New York. But it's been an interesting time to be in the hygiene field for sure. We have all right. Um, the struggle. Seen a, seen a lot of things change, that's for sure. Andy, welcome back. How are things? At, they're at the homestead in Bend, Oregon. <laughs> the the quarantine bunker is is uh, yeah. It's it's something else. It's something else. Well, I'll tell you a funny one, Andy. You know, most people that are within our age group have children, okay? Yes, yes. And um, what am I seeing other dads do when we're having moments of, uh, of, of disobedience? I got a guy that lives in this house right down the street. He's a gym teacher. His wife's also a teacher, okay? Three boys, one set of twins that's like nine and then like an 11-year-old. Mm-hmm. I'll go out to get the paper in the morning, and he's got them running laps. I'm like, ah, nice. oh, good to see you. Why I got the kids running laps? He's like, if they run laps, I don't have to beat them. <laughs> <laughs> truth. Hashtag truth. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, it's, uh, uh, it, it's true. It, it, I mean, you're looking at, I have a beautiful setup to record right. stuff mm-hmm. at my office. It's not my bedroom. You know, this is my, right. this is my bedroom. There's laundry over here. There's it. my closet. Anyway, it's, this is the, we do what we got to do. We do what we got to do. So, uh, do you have, uh, I don't know who's watching on Facebook. I'm going to pull that up right now. Ooh, I like that shot. I like that shot. Thank you. Uh, we got four people watching on, on Facebook. Uh, Sean Michael Lewis gave us a thumbs up. I like it. Uh, cool. Okay. There's no, uh, all right. I'm not seeing any messages there. Okay. Let's get back to it. Uh, so current testing, we were just about to wrap up current testing methods. So ATP, I know what a luminometer is, and I also know when you use a luminometer, an HPTP tester, you're not actually testing, uh, you're not actually measuring what you're testing for, right? You're inferring the presence of a substance, a biological substance, 
based on proteins that are that are generated by the meta metabolizing of of the biology, right? Of the of the bacteria. Yeah. yeah? That is that's an excellent Cliff's Notes description of how uh, the ATP swabs work. Basically, you swab a surface, you crack the little ampule up top. Uh, once the ampule is cracked, it mixes with whatever is on the swab that you swabbed. And once that is done, then you put it in the luminometer because this creates a light reaction. Right. And what is the machine actually doing? It is measuring the amount of light in the bottom of your little swab. That's why on it's the box, measuring the intensity it. and the frequency of light. You you it puts the light into it and it refracts or whatever in right. luminous luminometer. I love that. Uh, so we're able to tell, yeah, based on this, uh, we had one thousand counts on this swab before, and now we went back and we have five hundred counts. That Correct. would pass. That would pass. What we're looking so, at right here. I think we're getting the two of them mixed up. I think we are too. For, for, that's for that's pre, what I'm here for. For the pre, for the pre and the post. This is the biomass swab that does not go into the luminometer. This oh. is the one that goes to the laboratory. Okay, okay. Uh, you're right. It, okay. And then, in addition to that testing, which some municipalities are requiring under the terms of their contract with their restorer, they're also saying, "Hey." Show me on site that the surfaces are clean. And mm. it's in those cases where we use the swabs, to okay. the ATP swabs on okay. site, because it takes 15 seconds to analyze. And let's say that it's a, you know, a 500 square foot room with 15 desks in it. Okay. I can test all of those desks with, uh, I can take the thing. I can swab the, the top of the desk, the keyboard, the phone, whatever. And I put them in. If two of them fail, your guys don't have to reclean the whole room. We have two areas within. Mm -hmm. That's why contractors love ATP. Sure. Because it's not saying, oh, it's a fail. Sorry, guys, your spore trap said your numbers were too high. Go reclean the whole house. That's, That's why I like the, the Insiscope just for that. Right. Uh, True. Not to get down another rabbit hole about mold, but you know, you're exactly right. The spore trap tells me what? That that the area, you know, I, my wingspan's about six, nine. So the right. area like this around the spore trap, had something in it or didn't beyond my reach i don't know what's in the air over there oh, you I guys can't. have seen the chain of custodies for these spore traps that your hygienists send you it says volume of air 75 l what's that mean it means the machine sucked in 75 liters of air yep. okay that is nothing okay <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's like if you uh if you had the back of a suburban full of two liter bottles of coke that's how much air is in just the volume of those two liter <laughs> bottles and that's just the back of a suburban that's not even like enough the size of a closet no so that, that's why i mean i don't love spore traps for uh, clearance methodology but some insurers are still you know they're operating in the 2000s mm -hmm. they go home every night they watch office space they think jennifer aniston is still on television every night <laughs> they're living in the past andy <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're we're testing for these things. We're testing, uh, but we can't actually. The point I'm trying to get to is we can't actually test for COVID. We don't. We cannot tell you definitively whether you do or don't have it in your environment. So what do we do? We go all the way to overkill, right? We have to. Right. That's that's the only way because. Anything less than that, we're we're opening ourselves up to liability. Talk to us, talk to us about where you see the liability going in this in this environment. The legal standard that you hear when you're involved in depositions related to environmental issues is ordinary, reasonable, prudent person. Ooh. What would an ordinary, reasonable, prudent person expect when entering? Uh, a public space, a uh, semi-public private space, like the lobby of an office building, for instance. What are your expectations? Mm -hmm. Andy, I don't think that I'm going uh, too far beyond when I say my expectations have certainly changed from you know before the Chiefs won the Super Bowl in February to what they are now. What do you expect? I can tell you here in the Northeast, um, big box stores, Costco, Sam's Club, BJ's, uh, grocery stores, um, 
even hardware stores to a certain extent. They're, they've completely changed their cleaning parameters, even if they don't have a confirmed case walking through. Why do they do this? But they're doing this because they know statistically it's likely a sick person has walked through their store. Yep. And they have an obligation to, in a reasonable, prudent manner, do conduct something cleaning. about it. Yes, do, exactly. Because it's like we were talking about before. 19 years from now, when the lawyers are on TV, did you walk through a Home Depot during the lockdown? Did you get, subsequently get sick? Were you exposed to chemicals that you don't know? I mean, seriously, that's where it's going to go. So for me, where does the liability go at this point? I think that commercial property managers have an obligation, especially for common spaces or public spaces or semi-public private spaces, to have a disinfectant application cleaning program more than just let's roll the yellow mop bucket across the floor and make the floor look clean. Because really that's, that's what they were doing before. And that's a documented program, much right. like the OSHA, uh, you know, OSHA documentation you have to go through. You have to, you have to document y y your attendance at, at the um, tailgate meetings. And, right. it's, and at that point, it's more about the paperwork than it is about the actual job. It is, but I can tell you that, I mean, my eyes are seeing uh, those that are hiring third-party contractors to do the work are taking it very seriously. Good. Um, I'm seeing excellent uh, gowning and degowning and doffing and donning and, and all that sort of thing. And, and it's being documented. It's not just, okay, guys, let's go in and uh, uh, get this wiped down and make it look good for the people. No, they they actually care, and they're doing it right. Good. Now, you told me about uh, a, a retail a retailer mm -hmm. who was having um, was using uh, having their contractor or their service provider use UV light in a very unique way. Can you describe that? Are you at liberty to say that? I am. Um, I there's a, a whole bag of tricks related to this UV light issue. First of all, UV light and its brothers and sisters, the uh, hydroxyl, the hydroxyl, biosweep, ozone. ozone. Yes. Right. None of these things are on the list. And all you're the talking dirty to me, really. Look, yeah. Why, why are they not on the list? Well, they're not on the list of approved they're not chemicals. chemicals. They're not chemicals. <laughs> okay. There is chemistry happening, but they don't come in a bottle. You don't spray it out of right. something. It's exactly okay. T address that for us. So it's not on the end list, but it's still probably an effective method. So what I have seen is there is a variety of contractors that are doing this uh, COVID cleanup. Uh, there's one that I know of that I was consulted on about how they could do this as a commercial enterprise. And they started a company called CDCon down in Fort Myers, Florida. Okay. And they're using these things that look like a giant Roomba vacuum. Um, and they are going ahead and having, I don't know, a five or six foot UV cage on top of it. It's got these huge UV lights and it goes through the environment. And because of the intensity of the ultraviolet light, uh, this company called CDCon, uh, it's one of the various methods that they're using that I guarantee you a lot of the other contractors who conduct restoration work wouldn't even have known it was a thing. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've reviewed the science of it from the owner of this company. He's a rebel, Brian Bland. You've probably seen him on here before. Uh, and, uh, Brian full time is the proprietor of iMold, and prior to that, H20911 there in Southwest Florida. Hmm. And he called me six weeks ago, John. This is going to be really serious, and and my demographic here in Southwest Florida is in that demographic with the big number on the bar graph. Yeah, I want to protect my people, and and you know he he's a veteran and he uh, is doing things the right way. But this tower is cool. You should go look at it. It's on his web page. Uh, it's c-decon.com. Okay. Um, and it's neat. There are three different levels of the disinfectant application that we're seeing. We're seeing just preventative cleaning, like we were just discussing, the big box stores who 
are having risk managers, I guarantee you, on a conference call uh, twice a week saying, how do we prevent ourselves from getting sued? Well, we better send in contractors to clean this and make yep. sure they're doing things the right way. Yep. Then we have presumed exposure, level mm. two. A person that more likely than not had uh, COVID-19 as a result of uh, coronavirus exposure. And so they're essentially doing the same type of cleaning, but I've seen that the uh, PPE that is used, instead of just the paper masks, the guys have the half face on, the okay. P100, okay? And then we have uh, level three, which is a confirmed case. In a confirmed case, one of the many things I'm seeing done is the contractor prior to signing a work authorization is interviewing the facility manager and or the person that is positive for COVID-19. Hey, here's a map of the building. <laughs> where me, did you go? <laughs> where have you been within this building within the last three days? What and did they'll take you a touch? highlighter. Exactly. They'll put, take a highlighter and they'll put on there, okay, I, here, I came in this door, I went to the break room, I put away my stuff, and then I was all here, 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 here. And the contractors generally are cleaning 25 linear feet beyond anywhere where they're saying that there was an exposure. And it's a thorough uh, hand cleaning, yes. disinfectant application, the whole nine, and, it, and it's under, it's under it containment, negative air. Yes, it is. And, okay. Uh, we're not, we're not really seeing them wheeling in the air scrubbers for a level one, but definitely for a level two, they're wheeling them in just on recycle. And on level three, they're exterior ducting, and sometimes they're even piggybacking. They're having the exhaust from one air scrubber go to the inlet of a second one and then exhausting through that. What do you um, tell people that say uh, that the HEPA is not rated, the HEPA is not filtering down small enough to catch this virus. What do you say to those folks? I would tell them to get themselves a t-shirt and hold, <laughs> and hold it, hold it over an empty shoebox, and then take a thing, a big Costco size Johnson and Johnson baby powder, turn it upside down and squeeze it onto that t-shirt and look how much of the baby powder is caught on the t-shirt. Then lift up the t-shirt and look how much baby powder is underneath. The HEPA filter are they technically correct that the uh, virus itself, because it's 0 0.15 microns, microns. Width, that it's smaller than the smallest part of the HEPA filter? Yes. But imagine the T-shirt I just told you about. It's covered with this stuff for the most part. There's some that got through. Are we fools for putting air scrubbers in this environment? Are we overcharging the customer by putting these machines in that, oh, well, the, the filters is, is too, the holes are too big. The virus can get through. You're just charging unnecessarily. Absolutely not. If that was the case, then why are all of these healthcare facilities that are treating COVID patients putting their rooms under negative pressure with a manometer, one of those mm -hmm. machines that, that measures the negative pressure mm -hmm. down to 0 0.5? Uh, zero two inches of water column if they thought and these are people that are taking cdc guidance to treat this like tuberculosis mm -hmm. because guess what they they know that with the uh respirable droplets the uh, respiration droplets that they can go 25 feet mm -hmm. you know so six feet is sort of a joke if the person's really sick and you know you're standing between your couch and your television and they sneeze you might have a problem jack <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. I love it. I love yeah. it. So, yeah, yeah, negative air containment. Is there, uh, now we're speaking directly to uh, the, the restorer out there that is looking to pivot uh, and, and, and do some more work in this area. Is there a market for building these negative air spaces? putting spaces under negative air containment in, in a, an engineered purposeful way. Is that, is that a thing or is it just an add on to existing services? All you need to do is just look at what some of our contemporaries on the rebel page are doing. Okay. If you look in the past 14 days, how many people have been looking for enormous numbers of air scrubbers? Guess what? It's not because they're setting up their own field hospital outside their construction office. It's because they're renting them to hospitals that need to put them under negative air. And then you ask yourself, well, how come these hospitals aren't just buying the things and putting them in themselves? 
And the answer is because they're a hospital, not a restoration company. And they don't want to get in the <laughs> owning, maintaining, replacing air scrubbers. It is much smarter to them to just rent it from you. Boom. So when you see these inquiries on the Rebel page about, does anybody have any air scrubbers? Hey, I would guess they're not going to do a big asbestos job. I would guess they're getting a really healthy weekly rental from a healthcare facility that knows that knows what they are. And that gets us back to the major point of this whole COVID thing. Know what you are and know what your capacity is. Mm. Everybody's phone has stopped ringing with the water damages and the fires and the mold jobs and the asbestos. Don't immediately be like, oh my God, I have to go be a COVID expert. Know what you are. Get mm. yourself set up for it first. Make sure you have the insurance for it. Make sure you have the HazWopper training to be able to go and do this hazardous waste operations because that's really what, that's it, what is. it is. That's what it is. And it's the guys that just try and pivot real quick without grooming the track before riding like a thoroughbred. They're the ones that are going to finish last in the race. Not because they didn't get a whole bunch of money on the front end, but because they got chased down on that money with the lawsuits that are going to come for not doing things the right way. 100%. 100,000%. Uh, what, 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 what are the expectations right now for, for contractors doing this work? What, what are they being asked to do? They're being asked a lot of questions by their facility managers. Mm. The clients that are saying, hey, I have, for instance, a Piggly Wiggly, or I have a, a Kroger, and I need you to come and do cleaning. What does that look like? And you have to be asking just as many questions as you're answering because we talked ad nauseum on this page about setting the expectation for your client. Don't say, oh, yeah, we'll come take care of it. We do the COVID cleanup. Yeah, no problem. We got time the COVID. And, yeah, time and materials, is that okay? Sign my work authorization. No, the expectation for the contractor should be the same as if this was a mold job or a water damage. First, you have the training. Then you have the gear, mm. and after you have the gear, then you go ahead and offer these people a professional service because you're only as good as the worst job you're going to do. Yeah, 100%. What are, what are you seeing out there that's just grossly wrong? I know we've had some discussions about fogging, uh, and there's, there's, there's people on both sides of that saying, well, fogging is bullshit. It doesn't work. You know, fogging is the way to go. That's the only way to get the dwell time, blah, blah, blah. No, you don't get the dwell time with a fogger. You have to have, you know, you have to have an electrostatic application. Blah, blah. Where, where are you at with fogging? Fogging is effective as a part of an effective uh, coronavirus disinfectant application. Okay. Why are we fogging? We're fogging because I don't care if you have the people with the most meticulous cleaning ability, there are going to be surfaces where they don't get to everything. The fogging is sort of a secondary service that you're offering in addition to having the workers and the technicians and the operators in the full PPE with the appropriate uh, endless chemicals doing hand application. Mm. Belt and suspenders. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's okay. I'm not, I'm not averse to it on some of the protocols that uh, I've been drafting for our membership. Uh, it's included uh, using uh, fogging as a component. But mm. what, I've, what I've heard and shot down real quick is, uh, oh, just get yourself some Procure and an electrostatic sprayer, and you can just fog. You can mm. just fog. You do, this this facility is too big for us to clean everything. We only have six guys. So if we just fog, we should be okay. And I'm saying, no. Hmm. Well, well, John, why no? You're going to cost me a big job here. Like, <laughs> no, I'm not costing you a big job. It doesn't look like it right now because your eyes were in the shape of dollar signs like Bug Bunny just now. But do <laughs> things the right way. You're going to have to spend a lot more on labor because you can't clean this 270,000 square foot manufacturing facility with six guys and your 10 year old F three fifty van. Like it's just <laughs> not going to happen. And they don't like to hear it, but thankfully that that's another case down in New Jersey. They listen to me and they're like, okay, what do we need? We're going to have to lay out a lot more to get this done. Right. But they did it right. And guess mm -hmm. what? They had a much happier client than just a bunch of guys in there with the, with the ghostbusters backpack, uh, electrostatic sprayer, 
fogging the structure and saying, okay, we're done. This is not fumigation. We are not um, rodent control experts. <laughs> we're trying to control and, and uh, effectively uh, render inert a virus that we can't see or hear or touch or smell. Where, when the dust settles, and, and I'm watching the numbers pretty closely, uh, here in Oregon we're seeing a plateau, uh, and I'm anticipating over the next couple of days we're actually going to see start to see the drop. We're going to come on the other side of this, this magic flat curve that we're all talking about. Once we've... Once we've gone past this, let's say June, hopefully, hopefully not July, what does this world look like from, from the perspective of an IH, of, of a professional restorer who does uh, disinfection? What, what, is, what is a new normal on the other side of this? What, and I'm anticipating just different expectations from, from building owners and, and, and folks like that. So. What do you think? I think that facility managers, building owners, and property managers are going to understand that they can't just use a janitorial company anymore. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to use a professional company with trained technicians that know more than just how to operate a mop and a bucket. Uh, trained technicians that uh, understand uh, dangers of environments. Um, I think that there's going to have to be disinfectant application um, it's going to cost more money. Things are going to get more expensive and it's going to get more expensive, not just for us to conduct work because of the issues related to having all of these different facilities that are going to need cleaning. But for me, I think that in the restoration field, contractors that are just focused on chasing fires or doing mold and water damage or handling asbestos abatement or doing lead abatement, Nobody is going to specialize unless it's a standalone company in COVID cleanup. But I think disinfectant application is something that almost everyone who's a member of uh, this group can make a real uh, profit generator for uh, 2020 and into the future. I also think that um, we haven't seen the end of this. Mm -mm. I think, unfortunately, for several seasons, this is going to be a, a seasonal issue. I don't foresee the government shutting us down uh, to the every year. No, no, because they're trying to get herd immunity put together, which I understand, and there's there's good science to that. But I think that we haven't seen or heard the end of this. Hmm. SARS and MERS are long gone. We have we haven't seen or heard from them in years. Remember two summers ago, what was ever it, all the the pregnant females were upset about the Zika virus and the Zika. mosquitoes. We, we haven't heard anything about Zika. It's, it's gone. It's not a thing. This is going to be a thing, unfortunately, because of how pervasive it's been across the globe. Um, and and it, it, it transfers a whole lot easier. It, it's, it, you, yeah, you pass it on a whole lot easier. The, viral, the literal virality of it is, is right. stronger than, than some of the stuff we've seen before. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree. We were going to see an up and down. I, I think we're going to we're going to we're going to see a need or a demand for a whole lot more testing. Yes. Uh, people are going to want to know what what their baseline is everywhere. And I, I, I want to say, you know, at the, at the risk of hurting my bottom line, I have plenty of contractors that own the luminometer and keep their own swabs cold and do their own um, site checks after their workers have um, gotten things cleaned up. Every single one of the members of the Rebels, of course, should have an IH in their phone that they can call and say, hey, I have a shopping mall or I have a Whole Foods or I have a, a Lowe's where we're doing a cleanup um, and I want to make sure that the data I have is provable and verifiable. Mm. And why is that important? Science is only as good as its replicability. Right. Uh, if, you cannot, if you can't replicate your data, then your data is no good. That's why a lot of these guys will even do their own testing before I come in. I've had cases, and this is funny, a contractor will have a flood, and it'll be a 1960s house, and there will be VCT tile under the carpet. 
and I'll get the work order. John, can you please go test this VCT tile for the presence of asbestos? And they'll already know if it's asbestos or not. Mm -hmm. They've already sent their own sample in, and they know it's hot. They just want to have a third party saying that it's hot. That's not unusual. Yep. Um, Got to be able to replicate your data. And 100%. I think you're right about the testing, for sure. Yeah, I think we're just going to come out of this with a with a just incredibly heightened awareness uh, where if you had mold sensitivities before, if you had a known allergy to something, you were already you know, in your house and your workplace, you were already keyed up to, to look for these things. And maybe you researched how to test for these things because because you had a an adverse reaction to it. Now what we have is a national adverse reaction to something so people are going to demand a higher level of documentation and testing everywhere uh, and I, I'm excited to see what comes out of this technology wise and you know, uh, and I, I know the Instascope is, is looking at um, airborne biology testing as well which is which is exciting that's exciting to hear now let me ask you this you ever apply for life insurance Andy mm-hmm Okay. And when you go and apply for life insurance, there's like two pages of a question. Uh, were you in the Congo in 2003 through 2005, uh, right? Uh, there's going to be a question there. If you don't believe me, go to select quote and go and try and buy life insurance. And there's a new question. Have you or anyone in your household ever had COVID-19 as a result of exposure to the 2019 novel coronavirus? Get out of here. They're yeah. already responding. In they the are. underwriting, wow! Because it's an unknown. You know that they, they, they have literally five months worth of data when they compile China and what we have going on here and some of the stuff in Western Europe. What are these people who have recovered that are in their fifties? What are their lungs going to look like a year from now and five years from now? Right. They don't know. So, is that a risk you take as an mm. insurance company? Probably no. not. No, you cut that risk out. Exactly. Like cancer. Mm -hmm. I want to say one more thing. Yeah, man. There has been a lot of information floating around on the internet today about business interruption insurance as a result of this pandemic. There usually is no such animal unless you get an endorsement on your policy. And who got the endorsement on their policy that we saw in the news yesterday? Wimbledon, the uh, British tennis championship. Yep. yep. They bought for $2 million a year a policy for starting for, uh, I don't know, Maybe 17 years ago, they started paying $2 million a year for pandemic insurance. And they have cashed that check. And their $2 million, <laughs> which is a total investment of $34 million, they've gotten $144 million as a result of their insurance. Now, their premium is going to be more next year. Yep. But they're not hurting for money right now. No, so as, as the year goes on and it comes time to renew your insurance, there are products out there. If you, I mean, I, I'm aware of the products. I don't have them myself because we're a small operation. But if you have 10 trucks on the road and a payroll for 35 people, and all of a sudden the government says you're closed, or they're saying one man per truck, social distancing, or they're making some other sort of restriction, your business has been interrupted through no fault of your own. It's no different than a fire or all of your trucks being set on fire. Yep. So you need Except to Except for this particular situation has has particularly specific exclusions written into yes. your average policy. You yeah, have so, to go get the rider. You have to have the the addition to your policy. I, I know of a, uh, a large company in northwestern Phoenix that has such a rider on their commercial policy. Then they were considering cashing it in, and then they put out some very flashy, glossy PDFs about COVID decontamination and decided not to. And now and they're, they're the leader. Busy as ever. Busier. Yes, they are. Busier. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. North, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let the audience guess Northwest Phoenix. It's a big city. It's a big yes. city. Um, exactly. There's a lot of restorers there. So. There are. Well, John, uh, I'm... I'm looking forward to your continued involvement and uh, you being a, a leader in this particular space. I'm looking forward to hearing more from you in the near future. And if we've got, as things develop, if we've got to get you back on here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. Because
because this is a dynamic situation. Go to Facebook, follow my page, um, um, facebook.com slash airguysus. You can just search for John Evans, Air Guys, and I'll be right on there. I'm the handsome fella, a little overweight in the red shirt in all of the pictures. Um, and I'm just trying to help everybody make the world a better place, put some money away from my family and my kids like everybody else is, and uh, and not, not have to struggle. Because why are we doing this? Because we don't want to struggle. We want to win, and we can do it together. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for being here, and uh, we'll be in touch. Everyone else, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time.